written with the grace and detail that he admired in the writers that he published, Richard Seaver's posthumous book, The Tender Hour of Twilight, stands by Woody Allen's lovely Midnight in Paris as an evocation of Americans fascinated by France. There is one important difference. Allen's movie is fantasy. Seaver's volume is a memoir. Canapé discusses his importance with his partner, editor, and widow, Jeanette. We were all feeling the ferment of the afterwar, which was wonderful, a sense of sincere, true liberation. And Americans were heroes. To me, they were. Us kids would follow American soldiers. It was an oddity to us, and they would hand us chocolate and chewing gum. We'd never seen chewing gum. So there was a very sense of effervescence and happy moment of freedom and liberation. Dick had graduated from university. He received three grants that he couldn't say no to, that assured him a year in Paris, studying, discovering, speaking. So he left, he arrived in Paris, so excited to, he was an English major and it was all about, you know, the, the myth of Paris and the literature. The hosts had a son who invited his buddy, the American young intellectual in Paris, and that's where I met Dick. I met him one year, and I didn't see him for a year. And then we met again the following Christmas Eve. It's the same place, same beautiful place. And we went out together for New Year's Eve. Six months later, we were married. It was big romance. And in fact, that romance has started then and continued until the last minute of his life. We were in love and having a romantic life together for a great many years. It was quite a fairy tale. This is it. He lived Rue du Sabot, it's a tiny, tiny little street on the left bank. And there's another one called Rue Bernard Palissy. And in order to get to the Place Saint-Germain, you kind of had to walk through. And he sees in the window Molloy and Molonda. And because he was writing his thesis on Joyce, it just piqued his interest. Totally mysterious, so he walks in thinking the translations from English. He walks into the tiny little, charming little Edition Minuit, wanting to know whether they were translations, and the lady said, no, no, they're written in French. Huh, in French? Hmm. So he bought two copies and nonstop read one after the other and was, as I say in my introduction, was an intellectual explosion for him. It was an extraordinary moment. He was associated with a group of very interesting poets, writers, a Scotsman, a South African, an American, a Brit, who had formed this very remarkable, important literary magazine in Paris, but in English language. And they were looking, of course, to find French writers. So someone had recommended this Dick Seaver to them as someone who really knew the scene, the literary scene. And there's a very funny uh, moment in the book, which I read the other night, where he's being interviewed by Alex Trochi, the, the head of Merlin to find the French writers. And he says, I've got two or three extraordinary writers. One in particular said, Dick, but it's an Irishman. His name is Samuel Beckett. And Alex Trochi was very irritated. He said, yeah, but I'm not interested in Irish writing. I'm interested, 
I thought you knew everybody in Paris. And he said, I do, but those are the most important writers. And they happen to live here and to write in French. Also, Dick said, there's Eugène Ionesco, who also writes in French, and is Romanian. And poor Alex Trochi thought, we've got a, a bummer here. We just, we want French writing. And Dick said, trust me, these are the most important literary voices now. And so he wrote a letter, a care of Edition Minuit to Beckett. They had kind of given up at the Merlin Group on Beckett. It was like pie in the sky. Unknown writer, doesn't reply, on to the next. And one rainy evening, they were all cooking, with a group of friends, and the knock on the door, and he describes in the book this gaunt figure, totally soaked from the rain, handed him an envelope. He said, I thought you were interested, and here it is. And he said, won't you come in? No, no, I've got to go. And this is what? What is the name of the novel? And Dick was overwhelmed, closed the door, and everybody around his, his writer, fellow writers who were there, who, what was that? And he said, that's what? And they said, you remember that funny kind of Beckettian dialogue? What do you mean, what's what? It's what, etc." And they all read through the night, laughing, and each one took chapters until their voice got hoarse and they couldn't read anymore. And th there began their association from that moment on. They published it at Merlin, and the rest is history. A few months later, the same director who had directed the radio play put it on stage at the Théâtre Babylone, a very tiny, small, off-Broadway theater. And Dick was bowled over. He, he was really in love with the man's mind and work. And when we started dating um, in January, he asked me to come to see Godot wondering whether, how that would sit with me. And I loved it. And it was very, I think, in a funny way, I think that was a test in our relationship. If, if I had come out saying, mm, whatever, that, that would have been a very black mark. But I happened to really like it a lot. But you know, that uh, production had been going on for months. There were five people in the theater. It gotten terrible reviews from the theater critics. Really bad reviews, damning reviews. The equivalent here would mean that the theater would close, but they persisted. Thank goodness. And gradually, gradually over a long time, the theater filled up and there were and then the word of mouth began. Thank you.